Good afternoon, Minnesotans, and thank you to the member of the press who've uh, joined us today. Uh, I'm going to be joined today by uh, the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety, Commissioner Harrington. Also be uh, joined by a couple folks um, you maybe haven't got to see up here, but um, are going to add a lot, I think, to this uh, discussion today. We have Mayor Love, the mayor of Centerville, is here um, and also uh, works uh, closely with the League of Minnesota Cities. And then Steve Kramer, President and CEO of Minneapolis Downtown Council. Um, and we're here today to, uh, to talk and, and maybe give a bit of encouragement to our legislature and maybe inform Minnesotans um, about some of the things that are coming up here in the near future and the intersection we have with, um, with public safety, both local public safety, county, cities, um, with uh, joint powers, mutual aid agreements, and, and of course the state. Um, over this past year, I think it goes without saying, Minnesotans and the nation uh, witnessed some of the largest protests and civil unrest uh, in our nation's history. Um, some of them spread, uh, spread globally, uh, but here in Minnesota in the last days of May and the first days of June, um, after the death of George Floyd, um, we saw an intense spark of, uh, of emotion and crime. And what we're trying to do is, uh, since that time, while we can't anticipate every single event, there certainly is things that we can and prepare accordingly for. So in that vein, I'm here to highlight a, uh, a proposal that I have asked the legislator, legislature to work on for a while now. It's, uh, it's called the SAFE account, State Aid for Emergencies. What this does is it provides an account, much like we did, and I thought very wisely the legislature did, a contingency account around emergencies. If it didn't get to the point where we had FEMA help, flooding, tornado, landslide, whatever we see some of these in counties, where it exceeds the counties or the community's ability to be able to pay for it, we do what neighbors do, we help out. And, and that account has been incredibly helpful. And we think that the same policy needs to apply around these, uh, these public safety issues. Um, it's reimbursement mechanism to local governments for unplanned or extraordinary public safety events. Um, when several hundred thousand people descended upon Minneapolis from across the country, it overwhelmed even our state's largest police department and the need to be there and to have mutual aid agreements is going to be critical, uh, going forward. Uh, eligible expenses are things like overtime, travel expenses, food, lodging as well. Other agencies, whether it be uh, a police force in a neighboring community, a sheriff's, a fire department, they're willing to come and help, but these are expenses on those communities. And it makes sense when we have these larger events, whether it be an active shooter situation in Albert Lee, or whether it be protests around the January 6th insurrection leading up to the uh, to the inauguration or whether it was after the death of George Floyd. These are things that we can have an account in place. We can be able to use those. We can be able to leverage. And it also, with an understanding, is every time I bring in State Patrol, DNR, um, BCA, or National Guard, there's a cost associated with that. So we believe this is the smart way to do it. It lets us plan ahead. And for Minnesotans who are who are tracking this, you understand we're about 34 days um, from uh, the start of the trial for the former officers in the, that are charged in the death of George Floyd. And just to be clear, this is an event that will bring the world's attention. Media outlets from dozens of countries will descend upon Minneapolis. Um, and of course, activists, some there to express legitimate concerns and we want to pre protect their First Amendment rights, whatever that uh, voice they want to have heard, but there will also be a magnet for folks, as we saw in June, as we saw in D.C. On, on January 6th, who aren't interested in that. And our responsibility is to make sure of the public safety and those public safety personnel. And if we don't, and if we're not able to put this account in place, it hampers plans that have been being made for these trials for months. And so what I'm doing is, is, is asking, um, as I did a while back, but I'm asking with a little more of a sense of urgency, the legislature do their magic, work out, discuss what's good, what's bad, um, and then come to a conclusion that allows our communities to have the confidence and to start creating mutual aid agreements and start planning accordingly in the eventuality that whether it be a date certain that we know when a trial starts or a verdict comes in, 
or a situation as it arises in the moment, whether it's an active shooter situation, that we know that there's a place and an account that gives these communities and gives law enforcement the confidence that they will be equipped, they will be able to plan, and they will be able to coordinate together. So um, I'm going to turn this over to Commissioner Harrington to talk about a, a little bit of the specifics in here, and then talk about all of our partners in this, whether it's from the law enforcement perspective, whether it's from the local elected officials perspective who, who may be there to assist others or who may need the assistance. And then you're going to hear from Steve Kramer to talk about the need now after the rebuilding. And we're in a place where I think there's a lot of optimism where COVID-19 is at, where we're moving with vaccinations that this reemergence of especially the downtown areas is going to be critical. And, and just to be candid, um, justice will be served in our courts as it should be. This is an opportunity for Minnesota to put a face forward again to the world um, to show that we can protect First Amendment rights and we can make sure that public safety is adhered to. So with that, Commissioner Harrington. Good afternoon. I'm John Harrington. I'm the commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. It's an interesting day because I've spent my day on this topic in, in so many ways. I started my morning, first of the morning was joining the FBI and the Joint Terrorism Task Force as we discussed preparations for the trial. Uh, so this was all of the agencies that work with the federal government on preventing domestic terrorism, and we are very much focused with our federal partners to make sure that we are ready for uh, whatever comes uh, on March 8th when the trial of Chauvin begins. Uh, my next meeting was actually over in North Minneapolis, where I met with, uh, with black church leaders who are very, very concerned about what's going to happen during the trial. And we met with them to talk about what they can do to protect their churches, to protect their flocks, to protect their congregations, and protect themselves as they are looking at this trial and looking at what happened back in May and June uh, and are very, very concerned. So my last piece before I got here was joining 213 CLEOs, chief law enforcement officers, on a conference call as we brief them on the unified command that has become how the state of Minnesota, the city of Minneapolis, the county of Hennepin, the city of St. Paul, the county of Ramsey, and dozens and dozens of other agencies throughout the state are going to come together to not just have a first-class response, but to prevent crime and to prevent disorder. Part of what we talked about on that conference call was the SAFE Act. Uh, I can tell you that the SAFE Act was in part born out of conversations I had with some small town chiefs and middle sized chiefs and some sheriffs from greater Minnesota who asked me about how would they be made whole if they came to help. Uh, and they made, they made, uh, they made very good points about the fact that while they're willing to come, and they have come, they came and helped us last May and June, uh, they are very concerned about in tight budget years and in years where they don't have a, a fund that they could tap into and where the natural disaster fund does not allow them to ask for funding for this, they want to know is there a way that they could be promised or at least guaranteed that they would not be out of pocket, where they would not be out of budget, where they wouldn't have to lay people off or have to cut their budget in order to help out the other agencies that are around. Uh, I, want, I think it's really important for us to remember as we, as we get ready for the March trial that um, the March trial, while it was the activity may have started in Minneapolis, but we responded to West St. Paul for looting. We responded to arsons in Lakeville. We responded to riots in St. Cloud. And we were all over the state of Minnesota dealing with sometimes very lawful protests, trying to make sure that people's First Amendment rights were upheld and guaranteed. And in some cases, we were confronted with lawless behavior and crime, uh, where we were asked to go in and stop the looting and stop people from being hurt. Daily, we see protests all over the state, and I can tell you that as a, as a peace officer, we take a oath that starts out with guaranteeing and supporting the Constitution, and that really does mean supporting all of the amendments of the Constitution and supporting First Amendment rights. 
during the, the May-June period, having conversations with some of the activists, it was really very clear that the voices of the people cannot be heard when there is the sound of alarm sounding, when there's the sound of glass breaking, when there's the sound of fires raging, when people are committing crimes, burning up buildings, tearing down people's lives that the right of the people to have their voices heard was compromised by the riot and by the mobs that were trying to do destruction and make a profit. I've been talking to fire chiefs and police chiefs all over the state, and, and it's really clear that they, are, they understand that we're all in this together. Um, we want to make sure that safety and order is maintained, not just in Minneapolis, but within the Twin Cities area, and frankly, throughout the state of Minnesota. You know, I, I, I'm fond of the idea that if you make something really hard to get into, if we, if we really fortify Minneapolis, what can I expect to happen? Well, it may mean that they'll pass Minneapolis by, but we've also seen them hit suburban agencies, we've seen them hit suburbs, we've seen them hit other cities in the state. And so I want to make sure that we're well prepared. And so the SAFE Act, I think, really does set us up for success that way. It sets us up to be successful, not just in Minneapolis, not just in St. Paul, but all over the state of Minnesota when an emergency happens. Policing in this kind of context is typically local policing driven. Uh, I ran St. Paul and ran transit for a number of years, and I can tell you that with the exceptions of the RNC, Super Bowl, and All-Star Games, it's never happened in my 40 plus year career where we've had to pull together this kind of a multi-jurisdictional effort to keep the peace. Uh, this is an exceptional time and this fund will be there to help us when other exceptional times come up. Uh, it is not for our day-to-day, -day, you know, give me a, a squad roll by because I have a hot traffic stop. This is for the emergency. This is for the extraordinary uh, and, and I really do believe that it is time for us as a state to have that fund so that local jurisdictions, when they are in need, when that time comes, when they have to make that call that they, that none of us want to make, that we need help. And trust me, as a police chief, that's not a call you as a chief make, make readily. You want to think that your folks can take care of yourselves. But when it does happen, we need to be able to help that chief, that sheriff, that Clio, know that they'll have the resources necessary. Uh, there have been a lot of interesting discussions about uh, what we're going to do to be ready for the, the trial and, and other things there. And I can tell you that among the barriers that the other Clios have talked to me about, they're concerned about liability and they're concerned about command and control. But as any other good manager of an organization, they also have to be concerned about the financial aspect of this. And, and this will help us answer that question so that when they go back to their mayor or their city manager and says, I want to be able to help out, I want to come over to St. Paul and help out so that the midway doesn't burn. I want to be able to go to St. Cloud so that that doesn't see a riot that tears down businesses. I want to be able to help out Minneapolis. So the downtown area, uh, with, you know, with the Vikings and the Twins and the, and the, and the Timberwolves, so that that's not torn up, I want them to be able to tell their mayors and their city councils that they have thought through the financials of this. The governor's already mentioned this, I think, is a very natural counterpart to the Homeland Security and Emergency Management Fund. Uh, it's an account which I hope we will never have to use. Um, but if the time comes when we have to use it, I want to be able to say to people that the state of Minnesota, the city of Minneapolis, and our many, many, many partners have looked at the history of these kind of protests. You don't have to look that far back to L.A. You don't have to look very far back but to Baltimore to figure out that protests after a trial do happen. And as I've been told over and over again, if you don't learn from history, you're forced to repeat it. I want, with this SAFE Act, to be able to position to say, we not only have learned from history, but we're well prepared to not repeat the destruction we saw in Minneapolis and St. Paul and other venues within the city, within the state of Minnesota. With that, I'd like to welcome Mayor Love of Centerville to come to the podium.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Commissioner Harrington. Thank you, Governor Walls. My name is Mayor D. Love, and I'm here from the city of Centerville. I'm also the first vice president of League of Minnesota Cities. I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak today on the basic premise of the SAFE Act. I think Commissioner Harrington said it all. I mean, he really gave us a comprehensive review, but I wanted to speak just from the aspect of a local city leader. Mutual aid is a major asset in my city, and it's a major asset for many other cities around the state. Collaboration with others offers us the best opportunity to provide the best outcomes in emergency situations. If an unforeseen incident were to take place in my city, it's just really comforting to know that if mutual aid were to run out, that there's a fund available to us that would allow us to seek further reimbursement in order to take care of things. If we were helping another city and we incurred a lot of expenses that we could not recover, it's comforting to know that there is an, a place that we could go to recover those funds and those funds would not have to be borne by the taxpayers within my city. I hope that we can be creative though. If these funds aren't totally expended in the way that we think they may be or that we're expecting them to be, I hope that we can use them for other public safety initiatives. I hope that we can use them for PTSD efforts in order to maybe um, look at prevention or treatment in those situations. I hope that funding efforts create an opportunity for us to create safe and inclusive communities with a focus on racial equity. My hope that funding advancement in law enforcement for arbitration reform so that if in those situations where serious incidents were to occur, and officers were to be held accountable, that we can make sure that those things are done correctly in the future. Honestly, I'm an optimist. An optimist in me says this is a great insurance policy, and an insurance policy maybe isn't used for what we intend it to be, but that it is used in a way that is for public safety in the future. Thank you for having me today. Appreciate it. Well, good afternoon. My name is Steve Kramer. I'm the president and CEO of the Minneapolis Downtown Council and Downtown Improvement District. And with my colleague, Jonathan Weinhagen of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber, we submitted a letter to the legislature on behalf of the SAFE account. We're strongly supportive of this legislation and want to thank Governor Walls and the administration for the proposal. As all the speakers have, have said, we face a potentially serious situation in the coming weeks and months. And we've, we've been here before. The physical and psychic damage done last year that many are still recovering from, and the undermining of confidence in the safety environment now that people I talk to in Minneapolis, especially downtown, feel as the trial approaches, those are very real effects. And as the governor suggested, this comes just at the time that we're working hard to gear back up to reanimate our economy. So it's an uncertain time, but the best response, as everyone has said, is total preparation. Business and law enforcement were in a reactive position last year, but now we can plan and prepare. Now, I understand there's always a little back and forth in the legislature about what is and isn't justified, but to me the bottom line is this is a known situation with great potential to harm our state harm to businesses that create positive economic impact throughout Minnesota, harm to people who make their livelihoods here and who live all over the state. We must be prepared, and that's what the SAFE Act, SAFE to Count, is all about. Governor, turn it back to you. Thank you, Steve. Well, thank you to our speakers. I think that lays out where we're at. Um, we, again, this is not my proposal, this is me supporting all of the groups that came together with the foresight. Unlike the end of uh, May in a spontaneous situation, this is not spontaneous, and we can anticipate. We will hope for the best, but we will prepare for the worst. Um, and I think, as Commissioner said, if, if history is any indication here, um, these can be incredibly volatile. They can also be a great opportunity to show the world um, that Minnesota is ready to talk about uh, equality, to talk about uh, racial issues, and to allow and watch 
our justice system and our democracy work and then respond as we should afterwards. To do that, as the commissioner so clearly said, is we need to make sure people are safe to do the lawful, legal, and the moral things they want to do while making sure we're prepared for those who come to cause harm, pain, disruption, riot, whatever they may do. Um, we sent this over in, in December, and we were very clear that we really needed it done by February 8th. Things are going to start kicking off and need to be prepared. This trial is starting, and the judge has confirmed that they're going March 8th. We're 34 days out. A lot of these mutual aid agreements will need to be negotiated, get signed, um, numerous conversations around the plans. We are partners all together in this. Um, and, and we need to understand what the resources are going to be made available and how much can we use and where will that support come from. So this is a smart thing. I'd ask the legislature, um, I understand that, you know, we negotiate, do that. Um, we've got till May to get a budget done. There's a lot more negotiations. Um, get this scheduled. I mean, it, there's not a hearing, there's not a hearing yet. And, um, there's not a bill on in one side. Now, in the House, there is. They're starting to move it. Um, that's the job of the legislature to work out their differences. But I need to, to just emphasize for the people of Minnesota, um, this is the way the legislature works. It's supposed to work. They'll have control over the money. They'll set the parameters around it. The experts that are out there and the building the coalition around it is what we've done. Um, it's robust. It's agreed upon. You hear it here. It's a very diverse group. Um, meant on results for our state and for our communities. With that, any questions? Governor, um, anybody who watched that House hearing yesterday would take away from that that there's almost zero chance that this bill gets passed by next Monday, let alone any time in the near future. Uh, so we know Minneapolis is down officers are barely able to s schedule or cover some of the shifts they've got now. What's plan B if this does not pass? Even Well, we're certainly working it. Um, there's certainly the cost. I certainly uh, have the ability, and again, for all of the complaints about the ability of executive authority to try and move where we can, um, the real fix is to have them in this and to be partners. Um, I can do what I can do, and I think people are seeing this. These are law enforcement activities. And as Commissioner Harrington said, they're under local control. The state's there to try and support. So we, we're doing what we can do. But again, I would note that when I put... For example, National Guard troops on the streets, they need to be accompanied by law enforcement. Legally, they need to be able to do that, and you have to have that number of law enforcement. That's where these mutual aid agreements. So we're working through those. Um, we're seeing what we're able to do and what we're able to supply, but I think for Minnesotans to understand here is uh, it will hamper our response if they don't move. And, and this is what the legislature is supposed to do. They have ample opportunity to do this, and I would just encourage them to move. Governor, do you, are you seeing a theme here? I mean, a lot of the stuff that's coming across resistance here in the legislature has to do with uh, the, the $150 million in bonds to help rebuild Minneapolis-St. Paul. Now there's this issue. And you last year faced a lot of criticism from Republicans, particularly in the Senate, over the sluggish response last summer. I mean, what's your response to, to Republicans who, who, who are quibbling and, and having issues with, with this ask currently um, and, and, your, and your responsibility to ensure peace is kept? Yeah, well, we certainly differ, and I, uh, folks who, uh, who don't have to make decisions in the moment, who uh, don't acknowledge that we had no civilians after George Floyd or any police officers severely hurt or killed, we witnessed on January 6th how dangerous these situations are. Um, yes, I'm seeing somewhat of a theme, and, and I'm, I'm here today to try and turn down the heat on that, talk it down a little bit. Um, it was clear even during the election season where, you know, things leaked out and said, don't talk about COVID, talk about the riot or whatever. Um, what we've seen is, is this doesn't really know a political ideology. We know that there's a lot of folks out there that were anguished over the, the murder of George Floyd, expressing honest emotion in a safe manner that was overturned by folks who came in and, and folks who were involved in that. So, yeah, I, I would hope what Minnesotans are hearing about this is this is all of us in it together. It cost a ton of money because of that rally on January 6th and the threats that came out of that up until the inauguration, both here and in D.C. Well, nobody's saying that we shouldn't help rebuild the national capital, and I can't imagine Minnesotans and these legislators are saying we shouldn't help St. Paul because they responded to protect our capital. So what I'm trying to do is turn down what I believe is, you know, can be an attempt to try and politicize on this. It's not that. You will have it, and, and 
one side, and, and I would respond in any way of, of how we responded with our partners, how Minneapolis police responded, all of these things. But the fact of the matter is, we've got a trial in 34 days. We know that the odds are pretty good this is going to attract a large number of people. We know that if we plan accordingly, we can create a safe space for peaceful First Amendment expressions while diminishing the chance for uh for crime. And I just need their help. But yes, I, I think there's a little bit here that we're not going to rebuild Minneapolis when we're all in this together. If I may follow up, uh, the, the other point that they're making is, is this idea of bailing out Minneapolis, that, that rural lawmakers have some discomfort around rural Minnesotans having to pay in any way towards rebuilding, towards you know these costs in the metro. Well, this is the cancer in our country. Um, it's one that I have spoken about. It's what motivated my one Minnesota. It's what I saw happening when I was a, uh, a member of Congress in a, in a rural district. And suddenly, this is about dividing. This is never about trying to unite together. We're all in this together. And we're not, I, I don't need to get in here and debate about tax dollars flowing out of Minneapolis. It's this idea of trying to build us into camps and trying to bail out. I didn't send a bill to the rural legislators who were at the rally on, on January 6th that cost millions of dollars for National Guard and State Patrol or whatever, um, because we're all in this together. I would encourage them not to do it. If they cross the law, we will do something as we've done of arresting people who did arson, charging them accordingly. But the idea of punishing 99.9% .9 of folks in Minneapolis who watched a man die in front of them and as a magnet for the country to come around it is simply unacceptable. I, I hear that starting, and I would just say, First of all, it, it is morally reprehensible, and Minnesotans don't aren't interested in that, that, that we're all in this together. It's not bailing out Minneapolis. Minneapolis had this happen. It spread across the country and across the world, and now we need to deal with it. And the context that we know now there are events coming. Plan accordingly. Governor. Um, the another concern of Republicans is how this fund, how the funds from this potential fund would be allocated. Um, that that the Department of Public Safety would have broad jurisdiction over how they would be reimbursed. Um, so I, I'm wondering what your response is to that concern about ensuring that it, you know, it would be fair in terms of reimbursement. Write it into the law. That's that's they want to do this. They I, all I said is I set out the parameters. They can write this into the law. Put any safeguards you want into it. Um, ask how this is going to be done. What I'm doing is relaying on what came from local leaders, local law enforcement, about this is how this will work so that we have the sense. And I think Commissioner Harrington's right. It's not as if our partners in law enforcement said, no, we're not going to get paid. We're not going to come there. They took an oath and they look out for one another and look out for each other's citizens. But we should give them that certainty. And all I've said is, Work out your differences. The House version is going to look different. I, I mean, I'm again, this is a tough subject. We're not going to shy away from systemic racism. We're not going to shy away from what happened here. I understand that there's a debate going on here that some people might feel like we're giving more money to the police. My job is to make sure that I strike that proper balance and we can hold two things in our mind at the same time, protecting people's freedom and First Amendment rights by stopping crime from happening. And what all of the folks involved, as Commissioner Harrington said, from from black community church leaders to law enforcement are saying this is a good way to do it. I would just tell them, write, write any safeguards in. We can operate with that. And if I may ask another question, um, the $35 million number, I'm wondering if either you or um, Commissioner Harrington can pro offer some insight as to where you landed on that number. And it seems Go to on. also seem as though this is looking to be a long-term fund beyond just, um, you know, the budget for I this biennium? And, and would you adjust the, your request there, too? Yeah, I will let John talk to the $35 million. Yeah, I think we should do it for me. I think what the legislature did was brilliant on the the Homeland Security Emergency Management Account um, because you don't reach that level of damage to get FEMA uh, reimbursement on, on certain events. Um, and what I saw as a member of Congress, it was the most frustrating thing in the world to see a heavy nine-inch rain and a landslide and wipe out a, a township bridge, but it was localized and it didn't meet FEMA requirements, and that county and township were stuck in an, a, a terrible situation. The state setting it up to say, you know what? We're willing to help out with Whitewater State Park. It's really important because that happened to them. We view this as the same thing, um, that, that it makes sense to have it there. And I think Mayor Love talked about this. Um, 
My biggest hope is we don't use a penny if we don't have to. If we don't have to do that, but we need to prepare, and we know we'll use some in preparation, but hopefully it's there. So, John, you want to talk about the 35? This is more art than science, to be quite honest, because we've never done this before. That's, I guess that would be the start, the start of the framework. Uh, but in conversations with Chief Arredondo, Chief Axtell, uh, Hennepin County Sheriff Hutchinson, uh, Sheriff Fletcher from Ramsey County, in addition to partners from uh, Dakota County, Washington County, Anoka County, uh, we began to try and figure out what would the cost be if we had to do what we did in May and June. What's the, what's a ballpark figure around that? What was the cost that that individual departments incurred? Uh, and then we subtracted out what was the responsibility of the local jurisdiction who should have been there anyway. And so for a lot of folks that keep asking, well, isn't this just giving money to Minneapolis? This is a, this, Minneapolis would be able to ask for the money if they had a mutual aid request from another agency and then they would be expected to pay the mutual aid request of that suburb, that county, that greater Minnesota agency 100%. So the money would go through from the state, through Minneapolis, who would front the money, and then it would go to the local jurisdictions who uh, were not, it was not their responsibility to be in Minneapolis on a day certain or for 10 days certain. Uh, so we believe that the dollar amount that we have, uh, we have put together is a good faith estimate of what we expect the cost could get to. Uh, but once again, um, we really do believe that if we do this the right way, if we put people out there on the corners, if we work with the community, we work with the business community in advance of this, uh, that what we can do is we can minimize uh, the fires, we can minimize the looting, we can minimize the, the, the acts of violence, and in fact that this will be a insurance policy that we will not have to tap to great excess. To either one of you, um, we were some of us reported yesterday on the Sheriff's Association, Chiefs of Police, and the MPPOA, who all three said that even if this passes, because of the what they consider continued demonization of police, there still may not be enough agencies willing to offer support. Uh, is that a concern of yours? I mean, are you seeing uh, other agencies say, no, we're not going to deal with that? What I can say is that I, three months ago, I had agencies that said, um, no, we're either our mayors are not interested or we don't think we have the money or we don't believe that we uh, should that we have a role in this. Uh, and what I have seen every week thereafter is cities that have now said, OK, we understand why this is becoming more and more of an urgency matter, first of all, uh, and they are now anteing up. And so we went from I think at one point we were looking to try and fill hundreds and hundreds of cops. And in the last week, we were at under 100 cops that we were still trying to fill the vacancies. Every day, we tick off another group of officers who are being dedicated to this effort. Uh, and so I am very confident that we are going to make our number uh, and that we're going to, in fact, make that number with time to spare uh, because we've been able to make the case that the 213 Cleos that were on the call today with us who got briefed on the unified command and the plan that we have, uh, which is a very different plan, I think, than the, than what they saw in action last May, June. I think a lot of folks, Cleos included, were assuming that we were asking them to come in and be mobile field force or riot police. And what we're saying to them is, no, if we do this the right way, you're going to come in and prevent crime and you're going to come you're going to prevent disorder, and, and we will make sure that we're going to use your talents and your skills in the best way possible. So I think we're getting that message out to the Cleos. We're getting that message out to the mayors, uh, to the city councils, to the uh, county commissioners, uh, so that they can understand what we're asking them for. Uh, and I think the SAFE Act is, once again, one piece of the puzzle that will help uh, calm the fears of some of them that are worried about the financial aspect or the liability aspect of them sending people to help Minneapolis, help St. Paul, or to help Albert Lee or wherever the next great crisis comes to pass. I, I had a question about the, a House amendment here um, that was discussed yesterday around 
uh, forming a policy around the public assembly response. Uh, it seems that uh, policy must be based on best practices and public gathering management, um, and that this must be distributed to all chief law enforcement officers. Uh, Republicans raised some obje objections to that, so I'm curious to you know kind of get what's the administration's position on on a policy like that that would be required. From the Department of Public Safety's perspective, this seems like good policy to me. As if you think about it, I, I come up in St. Paul, um, which has had the Republican National Convention. We had the street ride rides. We had different events in our history where, as a young cop and then as a sergeant and as a captain and ultimately a chief, we trained the police department to be able to respond to civil unrest. If you're in a small department uh, in greater Minnesota, you're staff may or may not have been given that kind of training uh, to get them ready for this. And we think it's good practice uh, because part of what we're seeing is uh, we saw rallies all over the state of Minnesota during this last political season uh, where small departments were asked by their local sheriff to come and help. So we think this is good public policy to have everyone well-educated around First Amendment about what practices are effective and what practices have been tested. Uh, and we've learned a, a few things ourselves as we've gotten ready uh, for this, this event, among others. Commissioner, a couple questions. First, let me clarify. You feel you have the appropriate force, even if you don't pass this SAFE Act, that there'll be um, the number of people there during the trial that you need? We're moving in the right direction. As of today, we're still short the total number that I would like to see uh, in order to be able to, to use the National Guard and all of the other assets out there. But we're definitely moving in the right direction. I believe that part of why we're moving in the right direction is that we have they are, they know that we have uh, have offered this as a bill. Uh, I think many of them are like the chiefs and the sheriffs and the MPPOI who wrote their letter that said they are in support of the governor's bill. Uh, they believe that the governor's bill is a good idea. And I think that message is also percolating out there in departments all over the state who are making the decision about, yes, I will send you one or two people or I will send you 10 or 20 people. I think that's part of the mix of their decision-making process that we're in the midst of right now. But I am very confident that we're going to make our number. But, and but if you, not, if the full $35 million isn't used in a given year going forward, how, what do you see that money going toward? <laughs> that I don't have an answer for. I, I will be honest, that, was, that, that one's a, that's a little beyond my, uh, my thought process. If it, if it is like the um, emergency fund that we use for natural disasters, it rolls over until the next year and the next set of crises that come forward. Um, I would not be opposed to the idea that it is a public safety fund, but it is as created. If we follow the model that we have for the natural disaster fund, the contingency fund there, I would see that fund rolling over. And then as it gets depleted, um, you know, as we do with the uh, natural disaster fund, we ask for additional funding to bring it back up to the level that we think is necessary to get through the next year's uh, uh, emergencies that are coming. I just want to be clear, you were um, kind of referencing that the fact that this bill is out there, that's kind of what would seem give some confidence to some of these local law enforcement agencies. Um, but again, just to kind of double down on what Theo had asked a, a bit ago, if that if this does not pass and Republicans seem to be reluctant to do so, um, you know, does that confidence fade away in these local law enforcement agencies? And can you assure Minnesotans that if this does not pass, that there will be enough security needed to respond to any potential situation in light of these trials? I am very com confident that we can mobilize the enough resources to do that. Uh, we have done it before. Uh, we did it during May and June. Uh, we did it uh, during the period of the insurrection, uh, and we will do it again. Uh, I am very confident that uh, with state resources, local resources, federal resources, uh, that we can do what is needed to be done to protect the state of Minnesota and to make sure that crime and disorder uh, around the trial uh, or around another uh, event can be uh, prevented and can be responded to effectively. Go Governor, I got one off-topic question because, I yeah. I follow back because I, I want to, I think ultimately I appreciate and I, I agree with the commissioner on this. Um, Ultimately, I am responsible for that, and yes, I can assure Minnesotans will do that, but this is a golden opportunity for us to work together. It will be harder. It will be harder if they don't pass this. 
And I've heard relentlessly for months that the legislature does not want me to make these moves by myself. Agreed. I've asked them. I want them to be partners in this. This one was given in great advance, in broad support across the spectrum, and I even got requests from Republican legislators to fund the preparation back months ago. Yeah, I agree with them. They're right, and that's why we put this together. And so we will do what's necessary. It will be harder if we don't have their help, and it would go a long ways because the questions in here are very good. We all understand the tension that's going on here. We all understand the politics that starts to undermine this. Um, but I think it gives us a golden opportunity to say Minnesotans should have an expectation to be safe in their communities. We should plan accordingly. We're going to have what very well could be an unprecedented event around these trials, and this is our chance to do it. And, and those little details and those things they need to work out, that's what the legislature should do. So this is a golden opportunity. But um, again, by not doing anything on it, again, they're asking me to do it, which I'm starting to see a pattern here. If I end up having to do it myself, and it works out well, everybody's happy that they were part of that. If it doesn't work out well, well, the governor did it because he didn't include us. So um, we'll do what we need to do. I would just ask the legislature, this is our time to work together. This is very Minnesotan thing to do. It's it's foresight, and it will work. So, uh, this will be important to people. The CDC director this morning said that vaccinations of teachers should not be a prerequisite to opening schools. Does that change your calculus and get you to speed up? It's never a prerequisite here. It was never a prerequisite to opening schools. Our schools have been open. We've been in person. We have a large number of them there. This helps accelerate our capacity of doing it. We knew that when the CDC came out with 1A, um, being healthcare personnel, those over 65, and then teachers in that set, um, our, our commitment is still there to get those that are 65 and over. We're through, pretty much through 1A with our healthcare folks, and we've done a large number of them. But there are going to be teachers back in classrooms that are not vaccinated that the CDC guidance and the safety requirements that we have put in place will be able to allow them to do that. Do you think more schools should be open now, middle and high schools, given what I the CDC is saying? I think following the plan that that's the direction. I made it very clear in December that that was a top priority. When I asked Minnesotans um, for us to dial back, when I asked folks to up, which you have done, upped wearing masks, we are now... I think either the first or second state with the highest uptake of vaccines, we're starting to see real progress in this. And, and the goal for that was, is my first priority was to protect the most vulnerable and get our kids back in school. And I think that's where we're moving. We're having lots of conversations around that. I think the data is coming out over the last several months that supports that you can create a safe environment um, and still protect those teachers, which I'm, I'm deeply, I, I don't think those are mutually exclusive. So we never predicated it on that, but we, we know that it adds another layer to being able to do this. We've got an awful lot of our K-5, as you know, back in. Um, I have to say, I don't know who took the picture, but I was in tears yesterday to see the little boy given the hug. He couldn't stop himself. It was going to be an air hug, but I saw the principal with a mask, a face shield, a little boy with a mask on, and he gave that principal a hug. That's what we're fighting this dang fight for for that little boy to give that hug. So yes, I think you're going to see um, the commitment. I, I cannot thank our teachers, our principals, our school boards um, prioritizing, and then of course the Department of Health around that. So I, I, I'm i feeling very, um, well, I think I'm feeling very optimistic. You saw it, our case positivity rates as low as it's been in July. We've now surpassed vaccinations over uh, folks uh, with COVID. Our hospital bed usage is at a four and a half month low. Um, more doses are coming in and moving out at a faster pace than ever before. We're, we're at a spot where if we keep this momentum, folks keep doing some of those social distancing masks, um, we'll get this. I'm supposed to ask a question from Brian Bax. Teddy, can sure. I ask my question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the question's this. Um, you said there's going to be hundreds of officers involved in this response in Minneapolis. Is it possible that either the state or Hennepin County is going to serve as the requesting agency, and so therefore the, the costs wouldn't be passed through Minneapolis, but they'd be passed instead through the state or, or the county. John, you can. So the question is, is who's making the request? And the answer is we all are, because we're all in this together. So I've seen letter uh, 
Uh, Sheriff Hutchinson wrote a letter to his constituents asking them to come uh, and join him in protecting the courthouse and protecting Hennepin County uh, and joining in this effort. Uh, I am making phone calls to chiefs saying, please come join the state patrol. But it's under a unified command. And so it is it is a unified command where Minneapolis, Hennepin, Ramsey, St. Paul are all at the table together under one command umbrella and the state uh, including the State Patrol and the Missile National Guard are at that same table. So uh, regardless of which individual Clio uh, or mayor uh, makes the ask, uh, ultimately what they're sending their people to is to be part of that unified command structure and then the unified command would then determine deployment. Um, and then the unified command would be able to work with the city of Minneapolis or the city of St. Paul, or the city of St. Cloud, depending on where the, the, the crisis existed, to make a request of the SAFE Fund for reimbursement for anybody that came in to help them. Yeah, no, thank you all. And for Minnesotans, if you're just kind of tuning into this and, and know this about, about this trial, this is where we can show our best foot forward. This is what the planning looks like. Um, this gives us an opportunity, I think, on a lot of fronts to have a more sophisticated conversation about public safety and the rights of citizens and, and respect of those who put themselves on the line for public safety. And it also lets us start to, at some point, we're going to have to end this. I am not giving up on it that this continuing to divide and subdivide us and say this is Minneapolis's problem, not mine, for God's sakes, we're all Minnesotans and we're all Americans. And when the time comes um, to try and respond to that, I know that neighbors want to help neighbors. And this is an opportunity to do it together. It's an opportunity for the legislature to lead and have the executive branch execute with their will. Um, that will should be the will of the people. And I, I can't stress enough... Um, the sense of urgency around this. Uh, Theo said it, that it, it, the time's getting tight. It's very hard to move things through. But we all know that when you decide to do this, uh, it can happen very quickly. And I'm just asking folks, decide to put this on the front right now. Um, Minnesotans do not want to see a squabble about this. March 8th, come around and, and have uncertainty about, about where we're at. We need to deliver. We will deliver. Let's do it with the most certainty the most unity, and the most forward-looking plan that we can put together. And that time to do that is right now. So thank you all. Mayor, thank you. Commissioner.